Thank you for that message. Okay, we're, we're recording again. Might have stopped with the breakout rooms. Yeah, it must have. Interesting. Um, so, so yeah, you do have to go above. You, you do have to change the styling. Your site shouldn't look like everyone else's or the course. Uh, changing routes, view names, uh, you are, how the URL looks and all that, I think would be awesome, kind of making that your own. Uh, but then adding functionality, I think, is the real way to just really make it your own and go above and beyond. And so whatever that looks like to you, if it's adding a form so you can add multiple, multiple products at the same time, if it's implementing a way to send a text message to verify authentication another way, um, if it's adding reviews or star ratings or questions and answers, you know, all those different things. Um, so yeah, great. Any other thoughts on how to go above and beyond with the e-commerce app? Um, I don't know if he ends up doing this, but maybe styling the app to be more mobile. Ooh, that's a great thought. I don't know about you guys. Um, I have a, a mobile device. Okay. And I feel like most people do nowadays. And the amount that we use our mobile devices is staggering. Uh, so staggering that I, most websites that I visit, I end up visiting on my phone as well, even though it's not ideal, but I'll be in a different place or maybe taking a walk or, or in the store, or like anywhere, you know, if I, I don't always have a computer with me, but I always have a phone with me and I use it frequently. And so in our world today, our projects, our applications, they have to be mobile compliant that, or mobile friendly, I guess is a better word. Okay. So that's a really good one. A really good one. Making it look good and mobile. And there's a few ways to do it. Uh, a lot of people, they'll just make it so that you don't have to like scroll horizontally and they'll just make everything super tiny. That is not ideal, uh, but it works. Most mobile dev devices nowadays, you can just like zoom in on a page. And so technically that could work. I, in my opinion, that's better than scrolling, uh, but that's not making it mobile friendly. That is not mobile friendly. Um, so that that's a really good one. Any other thoughts? These are great, you guys. Could we also uh, make it have some sort of like hashing or like cyber security type deal? Yeah. Uh, on the back end? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. So adding another layer of security. Okay, awesome. Okay, any other thoughts, you guys? If there is a other language that we can use for the website, so language changing. Hmm, yeah, that's a great thought. At this point, I feel like it'd be pretty difficult to change the framework. And I feel like it'd be pretty difficult to change the node and the MongoDB. So you guys have to use MongoDB and node as the stack. You don't have to use EJS for the front end templating engine. You don't have to use that. If you don't want to, you could totally use something else which would really change it. And, and as you look at those different template engines, you'll see that some of them, there's a reason why there's a lot, okay? Uh, they all do different things. Uh, some of them do things better than others and worse than others. Uh, EJS is awesome, but some of them do, do things better than EJS does and other things worse than EJS does. And so that's a really good thought. In addition to that, um, incorporating a different CSS library, okay? I feel like all the classes here are always talking about Bootstrap and Bootstrap is great. Okay, um, I pretty much always use Bootstrap. I'm used to using it and then I'll implement my own styles on top of it. And just about every project I've ever worked in professionally uses Bootstrap and then sometimes other CSS libraries and definitely our own personal, st personal styling on top of it. Um, but there are a lot of different CSS libraries out there, not just Bootstrap, there are a lot. And so that's a, that's a really good one. Okay, great. Uh, Brother Birch. Yeah. Um, can we, can Node handle different types of templating engines or do you have to just use one? No, Node can handle a bunch. Um, if you just Google Node template engines, you will see that there are like many, many, many templating engines. Uh, I was meaning like in one app, like oh. one website, like have multiple templating engines. 
I um, think in theory, you probably could make it work, but I would never encourage you to make it work. I, I think that would be a really messy project to work with and it'd be really hard to debug. And um, I could see your thought, your thought process, you know, be like, oh, some things do this better and, and other things do this better. Let's use them both. I see your thought process there. Um, but I think it would make the application as a whole really messy and it would end up probably causing more headache than figuring out how to do something with EJS if you're using EJS. That's just my opinion, but I bet you could make it work. I don't see any reason why you couldn't uh, incorporate another one and you don't set a default template engine. You, you know, I could see it working. I've never tried it, but I can see it working, but I probably wouldn't encourage it. Mm -hmm. Great question. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts on how to go above and beyond with the app? Okay. That was awesome, guys. Uh, let's see. Next question that I wanted to bring up, two repositories versus one for each of you, okay? So we've talked about this a little bit and the end of the day answer is I don't care. Whatever you wanna do, it's what you wanna do, okay? Um, so you have that flexibility. Uh, I think it might be easier up front to have two because the Academy course starts you off from scratch. So if you start off with him from scratch, it'll be really easy to build it from scratch. If you start his course in your template project that you downloaded in week one from us, uh, I think that will be easier later on, but much harder to get started with the Academy course because he starts from scratch and you would have routing issues to worry about when he hasn't even taught that yet. Okay. Now where you guys are in week three, I fully encourage you to do that. And some of the stuff that I'm going to show you today, referring to project architecture, you will see that I have all of my projects in one node project. Okay. And, and one Git repository. Either way is fine. There's a reason why we encouraged you in the beginning of the semester you to, in the beginning of the semester, to use two, because it's easier to get started. And I figure, you know, the more Node projects you're in, then you know, it's great. You know, get your experience with, with different architectures, with different ways of organizing projects, different issues, different bugs. You guys are going to have another one in the second half of the semester, and so I think that's great. Um, one thought, I can't remember which room I was in, uh, but we were talking about this and, and he asked, you know, if, if I have two repos, would it be a good idea to put like a link to the other in the nav bar or in the header? And I thought that was a great idea, you know, cause they're both for this class. Uh, I think it'd be nice for you to be able to, to, to easily navigate back and forth between the two. Uh, and also for all of us who would be grading them, you know, so I think that's a great idea. And it would also be great when you use these in a project portfolio um, to have them reference each other as well. You don't have to do that, but I, I thought that was a really good idea. Okay, any questions on two repos versus one? Sweet. Um, let's see, MongoDB schedules. A uh, couple of people are asking about this. So this week, let me show you guys our prove assignment for this week. Give you guys a feel for for what's going on and where we're headed. Week three, your assignment will be 100% dedicated to your personal project, okay? Uh, to view the requir requirements, please click here. So here are our requirements. It talks about how long we're gonna be doing it, uh, guidelines for what it should do, and then we have a beautiful rubric here that says uh, how important each one of these items are to us when we're grading them and how much of your total grade they will account for. Okay, so there, there are the requirements. So this week and the next several weeks, your proof assignment will be 100% dedicated to your personal project. Uh, so this week though, you're gonna organize your personal project so that it follows the MVC pattern. Uh, create a JSON file that has the data you need for your app. Okay, so if I was gonna be selling artwork for a friend of mine who likes to paint, um, I would probably you know, take pictures of all of her stuff and upload those files somewhere, even if it was like Google Drive and I made them public and I put the link to that Google Drive file into a JSON, that's that's just fine for now, okay? Um, but then other stuff, all right? Uh, each one would probably need a name and a description, maybe a background story, a price, um, a genre of painting. I don't know, I'm, I'm not really into painting that much, uh, but a JSON file, okay? With all the data that my e-commerce app is going to need. Then I'm going to create a web page to get information from the JSON. Okay, 
Now, I apologize if the verb, if the wording here is confusing, but basically all this means is uh, you're going to write code to get your JSON and display the data on a page. Okay. Uh, make sure your app has dynamic routes and paths that, that make sense for your app. One example is adding the specific ID of your product to your, your, your URL path. Okay. Every product that you have should have a unique ID that you can reference uniquely so that when a user wants to click on it, they can. That seems pretty straightforward, but we're not going to be using like, oh, the 16th object in this array of, of products is going to be this painting. No, you need a unique ID for every single one. Uh, and then again, you have a rubric here. Okay, so that's week three. Now, the reason why I bring this up with the MongoDB question is because you're not using Mongo this, this week, but next week you will. And next week, everything that you see here, you're going to have to do the exact same thing, except the JSON is going to be inside of MongoDB. Okay, but you're still going to be working with JSON. It'll be really nice. And once you've learned how to do all this, next week, all you have to worry about is just getting the JSON to Mongo and getting the JSON back out of there. Okay, so that's our plan for the next for the next couple of weeks. Any questions? I have a question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Allie. Okay, sorry. Um, so when we label this inside of our different work, should we be labeling it as like our personal project, or should we be keeping it under Prove Zero Three? Um, I am fine if you do it under your personal project. That probably be probably be easier. Uh, if if you're if you really want to put it under Prove 03 in your template project that you downloaded in week one, that's totally fine. Or if you want to just be developing this alongside with the Academy course and leaving it in that repo, that's fine too. Thanks. Yeah, Jordan, Andrew, do you guys have anything else to say on that? As long as the link um, is understandable to either Andrew or I, that it's either your shop that you're working on or your Prove. That's all that really matters to us. We can figure it out in your code where, where you're working at, but um, the link on your, your homepage where your, your assignments are, just try, make it clear if it's either your shop that you're just gonna be updating from week to week, or if you're actually making links for your proof assignments. Sure, yeah, I agree. Just keep in mind that the proofs for the next few weeks aren't really separate assignments. They're just different parts of that project. So splitting them into separate assignments on your navigation might not make sense because they'll all link to the same place. Um, but you can do it either way as long as we can find it. Yeah, so one of the questions that I got was, so basically do I just have to do the, like finish the reading with the Academy course and do the coding alongside it to finish this week's proof? And the answer is kind of yes, okay? Uh, because at the end of this week, where you guys get to in the Academy course, he does all of this and you will do all of this in the Academy course too. At that point, the things to keep in mind is just that the project has to be your own. And so whatever functionality you're wanting to start adding or however you're wanting to change your project up, um, now would be a good time to start thinking about that and planning ahead. Sweet. Okay, guys, any other questions? So are you expecting us to, because obviously we're going to follow along with the Academine course and have a clone of his project. So are you expecting us to take that and modify it for our personal project or should we be building the personal project from scratch alongside with his for the class? Travis, that's a really good question. And it's not so really- I feel like that should have been made distinct back in the first week. So we actually know what's expected. So anytime I do any type of course, I'm always coding alongside them. You know, yes, I could go to the end of a chapter and download all the code. I will probably learn one tenth of what I would learn if I'm coding it my own and working through my own errors because I left a quotation out or something like that. Travis, I don't care. I, I don't care what you choose. At the end of the day, it doesn't make a difference to me if you copied all the code and spent a few hours to change it and make it look like your own at the end of week six. It doesn't make a difference to me. How effective you will be on your team project that accounts for 50% of your grade in the second half of the semester because it's so much of your grade, you know, you will be way more effective if you're coding alongside him. That's just my personal opinion. That's how I learn, you know? So, but if you can like, just listen to the course while you're going on runs and get everything you need to out of it and get the content down, then that's awesome. Okay, but if it's more helpful for you to actually code alongside it, then I would say do that. 
Um, I, I didn't really specify that because I felt like that was, um, obvious. I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that in a mean it's way. Not exactly um, the question I was asking. Oh, sorry. What is the question that you're asking? I, I meant more so because I'm, I'm assuming most people are going to actually be following along with the course. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm writing it as I'm watching yeah. the videos. So I meant as this personal project, is this supposed to be something that we're building separately from the course? from what we've learned with that from the ground up? Or is this just supposed to be, take what you've done in the course and modify it to make it this? The second one, the second one. Yeah, so the code that you write in week three, you're gonna be using in weeks four, five, and six, and when you submit your project. I'm not gonna tell you to go and write a new project in week six, uh, but you accompanying the course, writing your code, making changes and modifying it and adding functionality where you see fit, um, that is you doing the assignments. Okay, I'm not expecting you to, after you go through the course to go and start up a whole new project. No, that's what the second half of the semester is for. Okay, the second half of the semester, you're not gonna be coding any, I mean, you'll still be doing the Academy course for your readings and for your learning, but you're not gonna be submitting that work. Okay, that'll be for your benefit, but then your proof assignments will basically be implementing everything that you've learned up to that point in the semester in your own projects. Okay, but for this first chunk of the semester, uh, you're just following along with the course and I'm not gonna tell you to build a project from the ground up after you've done the course. Does that, does that answer your question, Travis? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you and sorry about my misunderstanding. Okay, any other questions, guys? Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I heard someone, it was a little quiet, but I heard you. Um. I had a question with, so just double checking with the MVC yeah. um, patterns there. Is it just to our understanding at this point or in total, it just contains the models, views, controllers, and routes? Are you talking about Provo 3, what the requirements are for this week? Um, this was with the reading this week. Um, just double checking that those are the four or are there additional ones that we are going to need for the MVCs? patterns for now that's it for you'll, now that's it yeah you'll end up adding some more some more directories later on uh but for now with where we're at that's it thank you yep okay anything else guys i just i just want to clarify oh. um i think you already said it but yeah like i already did the readings and stuff and i pretty much did everything here yeah so is that what you were referring to Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you guys, I know that you have a lot of readings to do. Okay, I would feel bad if after going through like six hours of reading, I said, okay, now go and do an entirely separate assignment. You have those with your teams, you know, you're doing separate assignments with your teams that are not related to the, the Academy course. Um, but this is a three credit class. And so I'm shooting for like a nine to 12 hour window here that we spend on the course included in class and outside of class. And so, um, so yeah, if you basically, if you just go through the Academy course and are writing code alongside him, then you will be doing the proof assignments. Okay. At the end, you'll just have to modify your code um, to make it unique and to make it your project. Okay. Any other questions? Kind of a random one, but can yeah. you go and put the Zoom link for this class somewhere on the Canvas website? Just uh, so that way I don't have to search through my emails to go and find the link. Yeah, so what I would recommend is you bookmark it. Um, that's a really easy way to save it and then it'll just be really accessible. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm all into bookmarks. I have each one of like my classes here and a bunch of bookmarks that are related to that class um, in here. And so I'd recommend just bookmarking it. Um, I have our syllabus bookmarked as well. Uh, and then the link to our Zoom invitation is right here. Um, so I would just say bookmark something, whether you bookmark the syllabus or the Zoom invitation or just this Zoom URL, um, I would just say bookmark that. 
also um, zoom saves your your history of the meetings you attended and so when you click on join and you have that window there like there's a drop down where you can look at all of the recent ones that uh, you've been in and so I, that's what i always use and like i think the name of this meeting is something that cc 341 so it will be easy to find oh that's awesome i didn't know you could do that thanks again you can also create a calendar in outlook or google and opens automatically so it can be good i should do that too i'm always having to like copy and paste links so I just posted, if you look in the help channel, um, there's a topic at the very top and I just changed the topic. There was no topic there before, but I just put the Zoom link in there. Oh, nice. so if you go to the help channel, then you can see it and get it every time it'll be at the top. Awesome. Okay, sweet, you guys? Okay, well then, let's talk a little bit about organizing our projects. All right, why worry about project organization? Okay, when you guys look at our projects right now and you see all the different folders and stuff, and you remember back to the day where you took, you know, your first programming classes or even your first web classes, and you had your HTML files, and you had a style tag and a JavaScript tag, and all your code is right there for the three languages. Uh, what's the rub? Okay, why are we worrying so much about project organization? Why do these node projects have like hundreds of files? Why worry about it? What do you guys think? I've always thought it's easier to add on if we have it nicely organized. Yeah, for sure. I yeah, having everything in one file, it's just not scalable. Like when you when you get a, into a bigger project, it, it becomes a mess. It really does. A lot of uh, a lot of projects that I've worked on before are you build the project, but then there's a lot of maintenance after the fact, where another team takes over and maintains the project going forward. And so, if you're building it and it's not maintained and it's like that all in one file or whatever, you know, it's not maintainable at all, and it makes it a nightmare. And that project doesn't really ever see the full light of, you know, what you intended for it. Yeah, so true. I, I have a buddy who um, works for a pretty big company as a software developer. And his test to get the job was to create a certain project, but he had to use the MVC model. So I think it's just real world applica uh, application, you know, to use it. So That's really cool, Matthew. And the reason for that is everything that was just said, okay? Uh, it's easy enough when you're working on a project to kind of do whatever you want and put all the code in one file and it doesn't matter because you just want a finished product. Um, but in the real world, that's not how it goes. You know, a client will pay millions of dollars for a web application and they're not just gonna drop it after it's done. No, they're gonna continue to want development to, to be done on it and maintenance for sure. And so there, there's a really delicate balance between being as productive as possible now um, and allowing yourself to be as productive as possible later. You know, I, I was helping with, with a project of a friend of mine who worked at GM a while back and he, he invited me to, to collaborate on his repository and I cloned the code and I looked at it and every single JavaScript file that he had was several thousand lines of code. And I was like, come on, man, what is this? And we talked about it and I didn't even have to bring it up. He's like, before I even started, he's like, Nate, I'm really sorry about the project. Like he knew, he, he was like ashamed of it. <laughs> but the reason why I got to that point is because he was going for the minimum viable product in a short of time as possible. Okay, and he was trying to start up a business. It's understandable why, why he'd go that route. But now, like a year later, he's still neck deep in this code that's just really messy, really unorganized. Um, and it's really hard to navigate. It's really hard to find issues. There's a huge issue with scope. You know, when you get into that much data, all sharing the same scope, it causes lots of unanticipated issues. And so, you know, hindsight's 2020, 
but if he had just taken twice the amount of time that first month, you know, to, to, to set up the project, then he would have saved probably hundreds of hours that he spent over the last few months trying to add new functionality, trying to fix bugs, um, just because the project's not built to scale. And, and he still has the same issue, it's, it's ongoing, you know? Um, so there are a lot of reasons why we worry about it. Uh, I love Matt that you brought up, you know, that your friend got a job because he was able to organize a project using the MVC pattern. It's huge. The MVC pattern is everywhere because it's a good way to organize projects. And it's also a good way to separate the front end from the back end and have that logic stored in different places. So if you ever have different teams or different developers working on something, or you have someone who is only good with CSS, and they're gonna be working on changing the styling, they have a place where they can work that isn't gonna conflict with everything else. Um, unreadable messy code, longer development time. This is interesting because when you have a single file, let's go back to like the, the polar opposite, okay? I have a single HTML file that's gonna build an entire website. Um, and I'll have all my styling and all my scripts in there. All right, that might be faster for the first little bit as I'm working on it because I don't have to make new files. I don't have to connect those paths. I don't have to worry about routes. I don't have to worry about imports or includes. Um, but it in the long run will cause much, much longer development time because of all the things we just said. All right, if I have a file that big that I'm working with and I have duplicated code everywhere, I'm gonna have to change that everywhere and it'll take much longer to actually develop the project. Useless repetition, cause difficulty implementing new features. Well-organized projects promote clean and readable code, achieve modular and reusable pieces of code across the app. All right, anytime you find yourself selecting a chunk of code and hitting control C and going to another file and hitting control V, there is a better way. Copy and pasting is awesome. And it's great using our text editors that can search across files and replace lines of text um, across all the files. It's fantastic, but there's a better way, okay? Uh, that was how code was made several decades ago. And we have the privilege to move away from that and to use small files of code that we can then reference in other places and inject, so to speak, into other places. And you can reuse pieces of code instead of having to copy and paste chunks of code. Uh, allows a project to scale. All right, you look at our projects right now. Yeah, there's a bunch of files. And when you're first getting started, you look at it and you're like, man, this is a tiny application. Why are there so many files here? Uh, but then as the project grows, you just add a file here, add a file there. The architecture is already in place and you can add to it with ease. Uh, requires thought up front to organize and then it requires much less work through overall development, okay? Uh, what is MVC, a product development architecture that allows you to create applications that separate the different aspects of the application, input logic, business logic, and UI logic, while providing loose coupling between these elements. This is from your course. I really like this, okay? Uh, we have our model, view, and controller. Our model will always represent data in our code. All right, you will see this a lot next week when we introduce MongoDB, all right? Um, allows you to work with your data, um, modifying it, deleting it, updating it, saving it, everything. The view is what the actual user sees and it is decoupled from your application code. And when we say decoupled, we're saying that it's just separate, okay? In the same file and in the same chunk of code, I'm not retrieving all the data from the database and just spitting it right out on the page. There are a number of reasons why we don't wanna do that. We've talked about a couple today. Another one is a security issue. Okay, we want another layer to go between the database and what the view and what the user sees to protect the database. Okay, the more information a user knows about our database, the worse off we will be as developers that need to create secure applications. Because if I am displaying data from the database using the exact same fields and variable names that are in my database, then it will be much easier to hack if anyone ever tried. If I don't know any information about a database, I will not have a very good place to start when trying to hack a database. But if I know what the data is called in the database or how it's organized, I will have a very good place to start. And so 
separating the view from the database using the model is crucial in today's world because if you ever have an app that's going to be used by anyone uh, especially one we all want to build apps that get used by like millions of people right and if we ever build one it has to be secure from from the ground up uh, then we have our controller okay um, connecting your models and your views contains the in-between logic. It also contains our middleware functions. All right. So someone mentioned earlier, I forgot who it was, um, adding hashing and, uh, you know, another layer of security. You guys are going to learn how to do that in this course, and you're going to do it using something called middleware. All right. We haven't talked about that very much, but basically what it is, after you've made a bunch of different pages and a bunch of different routes and a good chunk of your application, you can inject middleware to every single time a route gets called or say that that middleware should go or it should function anytime any route is called. Okay, you can, you can work it so that you write this function once and it's used across every single page in your entire application. Middleware is fantastic, okay? Uh, because it is a really good way to organize a project. You never have to copy and paste this code. You, you use it once and you have one function that does something like adding a token or adding some type of hash um, or checking to see if either a user is authenticated and you can use it everywhere without having to copy and paste anything. Um, so this is very high level, okay? But any questions on MVC on how this is organized? I had one more question. Yeah, go ahead, Samuel. So we got in the videos, they separated them into these middleware functions. If I if I'm understanding this right, I think it was the cart in, in a models folder with cart and products. I think something like that. Is that the one? Yeah. How when we're say like we're doing our own project, do we just need to look at the scope of it from like a bigger perspective, or can we just add a folder like that, like? A whole like oh we want to add like th this one is for shop this one is for admin but now we want to add something else can we just add a new folder um or should we try inserting it into the old folders like when's the point we need to make a new folder anytime the functionality is different um different. yeah so i mean with your example that's a pretty high level example of just like general users and an admin and there isn't really a third entity there. Okay, that, that's pretty much all there is. There's there's the users that are going to use it, and there's the there's the one the ones who are going to administer the product. Um, so with that, I don't I can't think of an example where you would add another folder. Okay, um, but with other things, I could see it happening. So like right now, we talked about how where you guys are at, you have a few folders set up. You have like a controller folder. You have let me actually pull up my code here. Um, we'll close that. Okay. Oh, this is awesome. All right. So check this out. Um, so over here, uh, here's one of my repositories for this class. It's called CSC 341 project. Uh, you can see I have a node modules folder, public routes, views. And that's it. That's all I have at this point in my project. All right. As this goes on, though, look at this CSE 341 faculty folder or, or directory. Okay, I have controllers, data, middleware, models, node modules, public routes, utilities, views. Okay. Uh, outside of this, I can't think of anything else that I would need to add at this level. Okay. Everything else that I would want to add to this project would go somewhere into one of these folders. Okay. But if I look at data, I don't have very much in here. I have store, um, but maybe if I wanted, so the users, when they when they make an account so they can actually work with this store, um, all, of that, all of that data is just stored in the database, right? But let's say I wanted to have uh, the users, you know, I wanted to track more information with them or I wanted to make their experience a more personalized one. Uh, I might make another folder in here called users. Okay, so it's in my data, it's users, and then I have uh, a bunch of stuff that I work with just for the users in there, what their preferences are, what their history is, 
uh, and, and how to work with that. Another example, if I look at like, oh, whoops, if I look at middleware, okay, the only one right here I have is, is authenticated. All right, well, there are many examples of middleware that I could use that I could put into here uh, that I could check. Okay, and these are just things that I could that I could incorporate uh, anytime a different route is taken in my application. Uh, but right now, is auth is the only one that I have in here. Uh, same thing with same thing with models. Right now, I I really only have a model for my store, but if I was going to add other things in here, I might need to add other other folders. Samuel, does that does that kind of answer your question? Okay, awesome, great. Okay, uh, any other questions on our high level MVC? Sweet. All right. Model represents knowledge or data, could be a single object or a structure of objects. So this week, your data itself is going to be stored in a JSON file. And that's it, that's as, that's as deep as it goes. You're just gonna have a local JSON file. Uh, funny story for you guys. One of the first websites that I made that people actually used uh, was built completely completely with JSON. Um, and it was awful, okay? It, it was a movie website. Uh, I, I stored all of my movies on a hard drive and it was great. Um, I, I would buy the discs and then keep them in a closet that I never, that I never touched. Um, and I would just keep all the movies on a hard drive that I could access really easily. The one thing that I didn't like about that um, was comparing it with um, things like Netflix, you know, uh, that have a really nice GUI. You can see like nice images of all the movies that you're looking at. And then I like looked at my file explorer for my files. I'm like, yeah, this needs some work. And so I made this, this website where, um, you know, I, I used some API, I can't remember what it was for, for movie data. And I would retrieve all this movie, this movie data, and users could could go in there, make an account, and search for movies and add movies to like their library. Um, but all this data was just stored in like a single JSON at first, and it was it was really really hard to work with. Trying to modify that JSON from the front end, it it was just tough, you know. And then retrieve it later and have it scale across users, it was really tough. This week you're going to be working with local JSONs, but next week those JSONs are basically going to be converted into MongoDB, okay? And so when you retrieve that data from Mongo, um, it'll look just like a JSON. It's just going to be a JavaScript object or document, however you want to think about it. Um, but it'll be it'll be much more scalable than simply just working with with local files. And so the model could 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 be a single object or a structure of objects. Could be really big. Could be really small. Uh, looking at this application a second ago, uh, you can see. Here in the models, I have a store, and then I have a couple of different models that pertain to the store. Okay, I have a user model. And if I look at this, uh, this user model reflects my user data that'll be in my database. Okay, every user is gonna have an email, every user is gonna have a password, uh, and then a couple of other things that each user is going to have. If I look at my order, okay, this is just when a, when a user actually places a transaction, uh, what happens with that data, okay? My order, I have a products array, okay? And then for every single one of those, I have a product itself, and then how many of that product we're going to have. Uh, and then we have our user, which is gonna be identified primarily by this user ID, and that's it for the order, okay? Uh, and then we have our products, which will have a bunch of stuff for the project or for the product itself, all right? And so this is my example of the model, okay? I have several different files right here to represent different entities in my database. If I was gonna have a database for this class, for all the users, uh, for the Zoom classroom, for maybe the assignments, whatever, for the time we meet, um, I would have a model for, for each one of those things. I'd have a model for the assignments. I'd have a model for what goes on in Island. I'd have a model for all of us, the people, um, you know, and so that data would be separated and allow us to work with that. Uh, should maintain a one-to-one -one relationship between the model and the represented world, okay? Oh, let me come back over here. 
So right here, I'm looking at my product, all right? And this, these are the exact names that I have in my database, okay? The user is never even gonna see the user ID. All right, I never show that to them. That's just for me to uniquely identify them to work with the, with, with their data. Um, but if I looked in, in my database right now, I would see that every single product has all of this stuff, exactly. And every single user has all of this stuff, exactly. And it will mirror, it has a one-to-one -one relationship to what's in my database. This is my model, okay? A representation of my database in my code that's accessible. And then from here, I can grab it. I can do whatever change I want with it. I can hide fields if I want to hide fields. Um, but this is what the model's for to grab the data from your database. It has a one-to-one -one relationship with the data in your database. And then it allows you to access all that data that comes through your model. Uh, the view is a visual representation of the model. I feel like this is usually the easiest one to grasp because it's the view, it's what you look at. Uh, it displays data based on user actions, uh, highlights certain attributes from the model and suppress certain attributes from the model. It is the presentation filter, retrieves data by sending requests to model um, so any questions on the view, on what the view does? Not on that specifically, okay. but um, what's your opinion on view models? Because I know you can return only the data that you want to use from the database. Yeah. So would you recommend doing it that way or having a separate view model of what you actually show to the user? Um, I think it depends on personal preference and what frameworks you're working with. Uh, some frameworks use them exclusively and others don't use them at all. And I would say that they're great and they have their place. So. Okay. Uh, controller, we have our routes, uh, links between the user and system. So in our last slide, we said that the user kind of drives what data the model is accessing. Okay, and that's true. Because if I go to a website and I search for something, let's say I'm going back to Amazon and I'm searching for a keyboard, okay? Uh, that will dictate what the model needs to request and, and what data I'm getting back from the database, okay? But it's the controller that kind of drives all of that. It kind of drives the connection between the view and the model. Because the view, yes, you'll click on something, but if you think about what we've done in the last couple of weeks, we have our route set up, those land in the realm of the controller, all right? So the user clicks on something to go add something to a cart. Well, the route is gonna handle that. And that will be like the middleman between the view and the model to say, hey, uh, the user added this to their route or the user completed this transaction and we need to make a new order. Then the route will say, okay, let's go ahead and let's grab all this data from our model. Let's change whatever we need to and then send it off to our database. And so the controller is kind of there controlling everything between the view and the model um, to allow us to work with our database. Arrange relevant views to present themselves. Uh, a lot of this comes into what we talked about earlier and what you guys have been learning in the Academy course. Okay, you have used includes for the header, for a nav bar, you've used includes for um, like the top half of an HTML file and a bunch of code that you don't wanna have to write and duplicate over and over and over again. Okay, well, there is no end to how many includes you can have. All right, with an e-commerce site, uh, I would I would encourage you to have an include for every single product that you have. If I'm on like a page where I can search for products, it makes sense for me to include a view of a nice product display because I'm probably going to use a very similar thing on other pages. And so the controller allows us to arrange relevant views to present themselves by, by us organizing this and having different pieces of code all over the place and allowing us to access these all together in an organized way. Uh, takes in user commands, sends commands to the model for data updates, sends instructions to the view to update the interface. Okay, questions on the controller? Okay. All right, MVC overview, models responsible for representing data from your database, responsible for managing your data, saving, fetching, doesn't matter if you manage data in memory files, databases contains data related logic. Okay, let's look at one more example of that. If I come back over here and I look at this model, this is for the users. Now, I have a little bit of logic in here and I also have a one-to-one -one 
relationship of the representation of this data that's stored in my database. So you can see I have the data all represented here that's in my database. And I have a couple of methods or functions in here that every single user is going to need. It's kind of like object or object oriented programming. If I have a car or let's say I have a class called vehicle. Okay. And the vehicle has to be able to move. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter if I have a boat, a plane or a car, they're all going to have to move. So they should all inherit from vehicle. Okay. It's a similar, it's a similar concept here where every single user that I going to, that I have is going to have to be able to add items to a cart and remove items from a cart or clear the cart if they want to. And so the model here is a perfect place for this because all of that logic can be right here. Uh, the view, what the user sees and should not contain too much logic. Uh, templating engines are awesome because you can render JavaScript with them, all right? If you look at EJS, I could write a crazy amount of JavaScript code inside of an EJS file and at compile time, have it rendered into HTML and have it do what I want it to do. This is not ideal uh, and, and there, there's a balance, okay? Obviously, it's really helpful to be able to do loops inside of an EJS file or any template file um, because if I have a hundred products that I want to display on the page, I'm not going to copy and paste code a hundred times. I'm going to have a loop and include um, that view or whatever I need to, to display that product 100 times. But outside of simple things like that, okay? Loops to display things multiple times, um, simple if statements to dictate um, what the view will look like. If I have a log out button, I don't want that to show if they're not logged in. If I have a login button, I don't want it to show if they're not logged out. If I have an admin button, I don't want it to show if I'm not the admin, okay? So the view will handle some of that logic, but it shouldn't contain very much of it, okay? Uh, and then the controller connects the model and view, should only be, or it should only make sure that the two can communicate in both directions. All right, project breakdown. Uh, we kind of already looked at this. Um, so any questions on anything that we've talked about? Oh, I just saw the chat. Let me pull that up real quick. Oh, it's the same one from here. Okay. All right. Well, if you guys don't have any questions, that was all I had for you guys today. So I'm going to let you guys go. Okay. I'll hang around. If anyone wants to ask questions, not in front of the whole class, I'll be here for the next little bit. Um, but good luck this week. Don't be a stranger. Reach out if I can help you guys with anything. And I will talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. See you guys later. Thank you.